Hi everyone, it looks like we are live once again. So it's hi from me here in Nova Scotia, uh, Donald Robertson, and welcome to week three already of How to Live Like Socrates. So, as always, if you want to just say in the live chat, hello and where you're watching from, just confirm that you can see and hear me okay pretty sure that that should be fine but it's always nice just to get someone confirming it um, also uh, if you're watching a replay of the video you can always just say hi and where you're watching from in the comments underneath as well it's nice to know where everybody is and stuff um, okay so as always agenda for today uh, having done the introductions I'll do some general housekeeping I'll recap last week which is week two and then I'll prepare you for week three. I'll give you an overview of that. And um, I guess I don't mind saying, like, week three is pre probably, I, I really like all of the content in this course. Like, it's kind of something I've been interested in for a really long time, as you can probably tell. And, you know, so it's kind of, kind of in hog heaven in a way, writing about Socrates and talking about it and stuff. But week three is my favorite week. The week that's coming up, uh, it's about friendship and justice and for some reason it's just some of my favorite content it's always been some of my favorite stuff uh, in Socrates so I'm really looking forward to it as always I'll glance maybe a little bit at the live chat I find it kind of hard to do that when I'm talking though so I'll mainly look at it at the end uh, there's a delay of about 30 seconds uh, if you want to speak to me um, you can put a question or a comment in the chat. It's better if you put at Donald in front of it, and then I'm more likely to notice it, especially if we kind of get a lot of comments. Uh, we haven't been getting loads recently, but sometimes there's a discussion that starts in the chat. Uh, how long will it take today? Uh, let's say 45 minutes. Like, I'm never good at estimating these things. Uh, you can always pause this and come back and watch it later, even though it's a live stream and there will be a permanent recording that will appear a couple of minutes after we finish today. So let me just check in briefly and see what's happening. Yep, bunch of people. You guys are getting echo, but it's stopped now. That's interesting. I haven't done anything with the microphone. Let me know if you're getting a lot of echo though. Shouldn't be actually. Might have just been a temporary glitch with the stream. Uh, but do let me know if there's anything weird going on with the audio. Okay, other housekeeping stuff. Um, there are about three videos, I think, in week three. Um, so there's a bunch of videos in here. <coughs> I'm probably going to upload another one as well, just immediately after I've done this. Like, because once I've got a set up with my microphone and things, then I usually like to like, turn out another video if I get a chance. Um, Quizzes, make sure that you do the quizzes. I'm really big in instructional design and like uh, it makes a big difference. You'll get a lot more out of the course if you have a bash at doing them, even if you don't feel ready. They're not particularly difficult, but they're there as knowledge checks and also just to give you a little bit of motivation. So definitely do the quizzes. And uh, make sure you uh, do the discussions as well. If you haven't already, go back and look at the older ones. Maybe respond to some of the other people's comments. So we're getting more and more stuff in the comments. Let's see how many. I don't know if we've got like a number on. Yeah, we can. Cool. 190 comments we've had so far. I like to get these little numbers in, some stats as well. And I usually respond to people's comments, not 100% of the time, but probably 90% of the time. Uh, especially towards the beginning of the course, I like to encourage people and kind of respond to what they've said. Um, okay, the other thing I wanted to say today, just before we get into the guts of things, this course is pretty big. Uh, the Marcus Aurelius course, for those of you who have done that, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, it's pretty big as well. I usually say to people, you know, treat some of the content as optional if you find it's taking you a long time to get through it. Some people race through it really quickly, some people take their time. That's absolutely fine. You can do the whole thing at your own pace if you choose to do so. And so I kind of thought, well, we've got a lot of content for this course, even though it's the pilot version. Maybe it's good as it stands. 
Um, but I am pretty certain that I'm going to add a lot more stuff to this course. So you have lifetime access to it and that means that any other stuff that's added, also if any of the content is later turned into videos, which it will be, then you'll have access to all that stuff as well. So if you go back in six months time, like you'll find there's a bunch of additional stuff in here. And there are already a whole bunch of things that I'm planning to, to add. So just looking at it, I'm like, there's a lot of content here, but there's going to be more. I'm going to need to think carefully about how to kind of steer people towards essential content. And there'll be a lot of kind of additional optional things. Um, maybe we could create other courses in Socrates, but I kind of just want to dump everything that I think you could potentially find useful in here. And like it can be there as added extras. Um, if it becomes too much stuff, but there's a lot more that I, I'm going to add. In particular, what sort of things was I thinking of putting in? Um, there are some more kind of practical stuff about cognitive and behavioral therapy and how it relates to, to Socrates. Uh, particularly, there are key figures and a couple of key incidents in Socrates' life that I'd like to tie in more, add more content about. So. There are some more things that uh, I'm going to add, probably in six months' time. And also there's another thing that I'm trying really hard not to tell you about, um, that I'm quite <laughs> excited about, uh, that I'm 95% sure is going to happen um, in a few months' time, that will add a lot to this course, but sh I can't tell you any more about it just now. It's going to be a bit of a surprise. Also, because I don't know 100% for sure it's going to happen. So I'll let you know further down the line. But I'm fairly certain that something really cool is going to happen that's going to add a lot to this course. And you'll all have access to that because you're already on the course. Okay, week two was about temperance and philosophy as a way of life. So I can see that you're all kind of getting into that. So I'm gonna skim through that quickly, respond to some of your comments here, um, because uh, I, just looking at the chat, I really wanna to get to the week three stuff. Um, so the, one, of the, one of the first things is the video about the choice of Her Hercules, or Heracles. And I'm really glad that I got to do a video of that because uh, there's a couple of things about it. I haven't squeezed as much out of that as I, I could, but I just want to kind of mention that this guy Prodicus comes up a couple of times. He's one of the sophists. He's one of the most famous sophists. Um, and Socrates is critical of the sophists, but they're not all bad. And he's influenced by them in some ways. And this is a really good example. He takes on board seemingly the speech from Prodicus and delivers it. And not only does it seem like a kind of quite an important part of Xenophon's memorabilia, but it's a speech for those of you who are into Stoicism that kick-started Stoicism. It's interesting to think of the choice of Hercules as kind of possibly the inspiration for the Stoic school. So you might want to kind of think about it from that point of view. There's the article about um, Cephalus or Cephalus on contentment. Um, it's one of my favourite parts of the Republic, book one of the Republic, very different from the rest of the Republic. There is a lot of good stuff in the other nine books of the Republic, but it's a lot of it's a lot more like monologue, and then it kind of gets into this sketchy political stuff and our, our theory of forums, tripartite model of the soul. So there's the allegory of the cave, and a lot of amazing stuff in there, but it kind of gets further and further away from Socrates. And book one has a very different character. It's generally considered to be more representative of the early dialogues, maybe more faithful to the real Socrates. Curious thing about this guy is that Cephalus uses this argument that Xenophon subtly attributes uh, twice, at least twice, I think, to Socrates, but it, here it's in someone else's mouth. And it's interesting because it's one of the concepts that is people think of as being integral to Stoicism. Many people think it's the essence of Stoicism, this idea that it's not things that upset us, but our judgments about them. Kefla says that in book one of the Republic, and he puts it in slightly different words. He says, it's not old age that's the problem. That's not why people are miserable. It's their attitude towards it. And he kind of elaborates on that a bit. 
So uh, this idea that Socrates came out with something that people usually associate more with Stoicism um, is in there. And also that dialogue is useful because it's obviously we're actually drawing quite a lot on book one from the Republic. You'll see inevitably in the week uh, ahead on justice, there are two uh, sections about that. Three, no, there are three. There are three sections about Plato's Republic in week three, perhaps unsurprisingly, and they follow on from Cephalus. Like, having heard from this guy, this sort of venerable old man, his middle of doing the sacrifices, and he greets Sto uh, Socrates, welcomes them to his house. Next, we're going to hear from Polymarchus, his son, like, and then it gets like a little bit more into technical, you know, more kind of like, technical philosophical debate. Um, then there's the article about temperance and the Carmides. I'm not going to say a lot about that, but the other odd thing is that here's Socrates talking to a young man in a wrestling school. Uh, then we have the the Lysis uh, in week three, which is one of the is also known as on friendship uh, in the ancient world. All of the Platonic dialogues were given these kind of subtitles. Um, Carmides is on temperance, uh, Lysis is on friendship, the Republic is on justice. And uh, so we're going to look at this dialogue about friendship. And it's kind of very similar to the Carmides. The Carmides and the Lysis are very similar dialogues. They're both talking to young men, if I remember rightly, they're both in wrestling schools. And we are, that is inevitably then, and I'm surprised nobody's mentioned this already, it's going to, we're going to have to touch on one of the thorny subjects that surrounds the Platonic Dialogues, which is the issue of Greek sexuality and the relationship between some of these older men and some of these younger boys, especially in the dialogue that relates to friendship. So it's a complex issue, and I think I've kind of given it enough space in week three without going into it too much. Uh, maybe at some point I'd do a whole section that kind of properly tries and addresses this, but it, it's a very complicated subject, unfortunately. But you'll notice that it inevitably comes into the dialogue about friendship. Um, and it's kind of there in the Carmides already a little bit, perhaps. There's a lot of ambiguity about the relationships that are going on and stuff. Then uh, there was the stuff about Socrates and self-control, like we looked at his relationship with diet, food and drink and exercise, a lot of interesting stuff there. And then the activity scheduling exercise we looked at. Then there was a discussion about this exhortation to self-control that we find in the memorabilia that's kind of about the double standards models. Uh, if I remember rightly, Socrates gives this kind of speech where he's saying, look, what sort of people would you entrust the care of your children to? What sort of people would you want to lead the state in a time of crisis? You know, like a self-indulgent person, a self-controlled person. Think about those qualities and whether you're embodying them in your own life. And so I want to just touch on some of the comments that people made. Wilfred commented and said, look, it seems obvious that I aspire to do what I see as praiseworthy in others. Otherwise, I'd be a hypocrite, right? And I find that interesting because, yeah, in a way it is obvious, but I... I can tell you from my experience as a therapist, we use the double standard strategy quite a lot, and it, the majority of people have, it's as if they've never even really thought about it from that perspective. And so I'd say the norm and workshops as well is, and online courses, is people usually say, actually, they haven't put much thought into whether the standard that they apply to other people is the same as the standard they apply in their own life. That, that's unusual, funnily enough. And hypocrisy, actually, I would say is maybe too strong a word because that, I think that kind of apply implies a bit of intent or a bit of awareness. Whereas for most people, it's like they just haven't really kind of thought about it in that way or they haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it in that way. Christina likewise says that this approach thinking what sort of person like you would want to fulfill these responsible roles and then wondering whether you're like that yourself or could be more like that um, is a good way of identifying our blind spots which is 
exactly you know really what's happening here it's a cognitive strategy or what i like to call a perspective shifting exercise that helps us to identify our blind spots basically or you could also say inconsistencies in our thinking the stoics as well would say that one of the most obvious inconsistencies in most people's thinking is the inconsistency between the standard they apply to other people qualities that they praise admire and then the things they actually desire in their own life. Uh, Michael talked about how self-criticism and there's often, even funnily enough, among people who are quite self-critical and also cr critical of others, there's often kind of disparities between the way in which they criticise themselves or others. That they, do, they don't apply the same sort of criticisms um to other people as they would apply to themselves and again you know as often often people who suffer from depression are particularly self-critical also people from so who suffer from social anxiety i should say there's a ton of research that shows that they're perfectionistic and prone to uh, to criticism uh, applying a, a strict standard and uh, and you know it's believed that may contribute to the the fear of negative evaluation that you have in social anxiety but uh, getting people to kind of think about whether the, they would criticise their daughter in the same way that maybe they're criticising themselves is interesting. Sometimes we're overly lenient on ourselves, sometimes we're overly harsh on ourselves. And just stretching our mind, looking at things from these different perspectives is a good way of kind of rounding off the edges, bringing balance and consistency to our, uh, our thinking, our beliefs. There's a quiz, do the quiz, it's really useful. It'll aid retention and understanding. And then at the end, there were some comments. Like, I like to get the comments in the what next section at the end of the course, where people are able to maybe just say a little bit about what they thought about the, the week as a whole. Uh, Bob said he found Kefalus uh, inspiring as a role model. I'm, I'm glad that you did, because, like, I read The Republic how many years ago? I don't know, like uh, about 20 years ago now. Uh, is that right? Please tell me it's not 30. It is, it's 30. 30 years ago. I read it 30 years ago. And like the, the thing that, one of the things that always stuck with me, a number of things did. And, and one of them was uh, this example of Kefalus for some reason kind of remained with me. It just kind of stuck in my mind. So I'm glad that other people just some find somehow something about it that resonates. Christina said uh, she was finding Socrates a breath of fresh air. I'm fascinated as to how you engage with Socrates because I'm convinced that people think he's this kind of beardy, wise guy from Greece, um, but maybe don't know that much more about him. And then when you actually start reading the stuff that he said, what I'm hoping is for a lot of you to say, I didn't realise he was a military hero, like he was nominated for the Prize of Valour. I didn't realise actually that he got involved in politics to the extent that he did. I didn't realise that he, you know, had this uh, ambiguity uh, about his method. Uh, it's very different from reading the Stoics, for example, which I, I know a lot of you have been into. I said that this, in some way the Stoics are like Socrates turned into bullet points or something. The Socrates were the, the Stoics were dogmatists, um, so they try to identify principles. They still do use the Socratic method, but what you get partly because of the dialogue form with Socrates is something much more kind of dynamic and ambiguous. It's interesting to see how people respond to that. Uh, Wilfred said he found the material on the f physical exercise most helpful. That kind of surprises me in a way, but again, you know, you might not expect that Socrates said that stuff. Um, and he often says quite simple but profound things about specific aspects of life that people were more familiar with in the past. Uh, you can see when you read the Hellenistic philosophers, like they, they really read Socrates and they take for granted concepts or sayings that are derived from Plato and Xenophon. And now it's like people have kind of forgotten all this stuff, but for centuries it was considered almost like proverbial wisdom. Um, greater self-control leads to greater freedom. There's a, a kind of insight that Wilfred mentioned, like uh, Socrates says that also a greater self 
discipline or self-control uh, can lead to, ironically, to more pleasure than self-indulgence does. He says there's a paradox about this. Melville Richard Alexander said self-control, not self-indulgence, can lead to greater pleasure. It's interesting that you guys pick up on that part. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm never 100 percent sure. Like, if I throw all the stuff at you, which bits are you going to think? Oh, I didn't know about that. Or that kind of resonates. Um, I think he mentioned something as well about how this is sort of the opposite of consumerism's message about greed and indulgence. I do think there's like, uh, I can kind of envisage an article. Um, a video maybe even just focusing on the notion that Socrates is teaching us something which flies in the face of the values implicit in the modern culture of materialism, consumerism and also celebrity culture. Um, when he's talking about the sophists and you know, a lot of the stuff that he says resonates very much today um, with celebrities getting involved in politics and the and the uh, social media, the amount of importance that people put on celebrity. Like a lot of kids want to be celebrities rather than you know thinking about becoming famous for something. Like a lot of the the things that we see around us in modern society, it's interesting. Like Socrates drives a kind of steamroller through the middle of it and is advocating a completely contrary world view. He wants to turn these values on their head, in a sense. And I think that's something that, that many people identify with, because you know, there are many people today that are frustrated with these aspects of modern society, um, these values that we're supposed to take for granted. And they, you know, those values existed in the ancient world as well. Socrates was a radical back then. Too, but there aren't as many voices today. We don't have a Socrates today, kind of, you know, suggesting something paradoxical. Well, the word paradox actually means contrary to popular opinion, swimming against the tide, as it were. Michael said the more practical thing to come back down to earth that self monitoring sheets, like actual forms, would be useful. And yeah, like I can have those. Um, I can probably dig some out and see if. I'm uh, trying to remember if they're actually suited to the exercises that I've given you or they can be adapted. So have a look and see if I can uh, add something like that. I'm not sure if I've got time to do it at the moment or maybe later we'll see. Um, people usually have kind of mixed feelings about forms I find. Some people really like them and enjoy using them and then other people are like, oh my god, not forms. Like CBT, there are a lot of forms in traditional cognitive therapy and so you kind of get used to this mixed feeling that some clients really love getting them and other clients are like, oh god, I hate forms. So I'll, I'll have a look and I'll see if I can find something. I've probably got something kicking around already. The bonus sections, Socrates the Soldier, there's quite a lot crammed in there. Um, if you want to just get this different, if you're interested in military stuff, or you just want to get this kind of different perspective on who Socrates the man was, that's a, a good article to look at. And it kind of helps give a bit of background as well. I think someone mentioned that they were, it led them to view his trial slightly differently when they understood his, his military background. And actually he very much, there are a bunch of things that he, he kind of hits on in Plato's Apology um, very concisely. And one of them is he mentions his military background and not only just kind of drops that in there, but he, he provides a bit of a kind of argument that, that alludes to it as well which I won't go into just now because actually I refer back to it in week four. Um, but he said something quite odd, making a comparison between uh, something uh, he's, something to do with his military background and, and his current situation, which also references uh, one of the dialogues that we're going to be looking at in week four. So I won't get ahead on that, but you might, reading that article actually would help give you some background that will prepare you for stuff that's coming, um, although it's optional. And then there's the bit summarising Xenophon's memorabilia, and again, if you're interested in kind of reference materials, it'll help you access the primary sources here. Uh, there's that part in the bonus section, a week two, that lists 39 mainly dialogues, but also some notes that Xenophon wrote on Socrates. 
and breaks it down into the topics he's discussing, the people he's talking to. I want to mention that briefly because I've actually just added another bonus section to week four, so it's a little bit way off. But the I've added a thing from Diogenes Laertius that classifies, it's a traditional classification of the Platonic Dialogues. So again, not for everyone, but for people who want to get into the subject more deeply, it's a piece of reference material that will give you a little bit of a structure that will help guide you through the, uh, the materials. So that's all I wanted to say about week two. And now we can get into talking about week three, which is what we've got coming. So uh, it is about the virtue of justice or dikaiosune, uh, sometimes translated as righteousness or uprightness. Uh, it's, uh, specifically, it's not only, I guess, got to do with our relationships with other people. The, the Greek concept of justice is a little bit broader than the English word implies. Um, as the other translations suggest, like righteousness or uprightness. It's a little bit of a more informal, a little bit of a broader concept than, than our word justice would suggest. Uh, it does generally uh, mean what's uh, the way that we relate to other human beings, both individually and collectively. It is particularly linked to the concept of friendship, which is one of Socrates' favourite subjects. Which is a curious thing. Again, I don't think most people think Socrates, friendship. But he called himself an expert on the art of love. And he means an expert at making friends. And an expert at winning friends. And an expert matchmaker, as he puts it, uh, for other people. He talks about this, jokes about this, both in Plato and in Xenophon. Um, so this seems to be very much part of Socrates' character. So friendship is something, there are like four or five of Xenophon's dialogues that are just dedicated to the, the subject of friendship. There's the, the Lysis, uh, as we'll see, Platonic dialogue, which is called On Friendship. So it's a big part of Socrates, although maybe not something that people immediately associate with him. And the other thing that's worth maybe saying about Socrates I guess it's just a little tiny bit of background before we get any further into it. it says, Socrates had a bunch of friends. He had like the circle of friends who are real characters in their own right. And he had enemies as well, clearly. But he had a surprising ensemble of friends that, as I've mentioned earlier, includes some of the most famous and influential Athenians. And also people that were that seemed to really come from the lower rungs of society, um, like I mean, for example, Alcibiades was uh, an Athenian aristocrat, one of the most handsome men in Athens. Um, you know, the, had a troubled political career, to put it very simply. You know, surprising guy for Socrates to have such an intense relationship with. Uh, and then on the other hand, so kind of from the top rung of society, um, as we'll see, he associated with several Athenian generals um, who were his friends. His One of his best friends, Crito, is a very wealthy uh, businessman and agriculturalist. But at the same time, um, Antisthenes, one of his oldest, uh, closest students, was famous for his poverty and, and he's often held up as being the kind of precursor or even the originator of the cynic philosophical tradition. And also, again, as we'll see, Fido of uh, Ellis, uh, one of Socrates' uh, followers, about whom Plato has a, a, a dedicates a, a dialogue. Um, he was there at Socrates' execution. He was captured and enslaved, and he was a very handsome young man, and he was put to work in a, a brothel, was forced to work as a male prostitute. So he was in a terrible position in life, uh, enslaved, like, like forcing to do this job, you know, incredibly miserable. And he met Socrates, got talking to him, pleaded with him for help. And Socrates went to his wealthy friends. I think it was Crito he went to and said, can you buy this guy's freedom? And so he did. 
and he became one of Socrates' best known followers. He uh, wrote dialogues about him after his death, and so he had these colourful characters. Um, and the way he won these friends and the way he interacted with them is like a whole, you know, a whole big chunk of the story in itself. But then there's the advice that he gives people about friendship. So we start off with this article that's kind of a bit more um, looking at some fragments and bits and pieces, as it were, from the memorabilia about what Socrates has to say on friendship. Uh, this might be something that I turn into a video, actually. And he talks about this idea of a shepherd counting sheep. So so there's several references to Socrates saying this weird thing where he goes, look, he obviously thinks that people just kind of take friendship for granted and they don't really think about it very much. But like what I said earlier about the double standard strategy, that he noticed when he asked people about this, most of the time they just look slightly puzzled. So he said, look, if you're a shepherd, like, would you know how many sheep you have? And people would go, well, yeah, obviously, I'd count them and I'd know exactly how many, and that's my, your job as a shepherd. And then he said, well, like, do you know how many friends you have? And people would say, well, that's a weird question. I've never really kind of sat down and counted it. And he obviously pressed them on this and then they'd start to think, I'm not really sure if this guy counts as a friend or not and I've never really put a number on it. And Socrates would say, don't you think it's odd that if you were a shepherd, you'd know exactly how many sheep you have and yet friends, which people say are the most important thing in life, many people say that, I, whenever I ask anyone about them, they just seem to be incredibly vague about how many friends they've got. We have this fuzzy concept of friendship. And he's really just using this as a sneaky way to kind of draw people's attention to the fact that they're quite vague about friendship. But that means, because they lack a definition of it and they don't evaluate it, that they, you know, they're probably not really taking care of that aspect of their life as closely as they could. So he makes a very profound point there, I think, with this kind of homely little metaphor. And also, uh, by now you'll hopefully be realizing that um, you know Socrates was known for talking about making shoes and herding sheep and you know about physicians and medicine and using these kind of repertoire of metaphors about various arts and crafts. Uh, he loves doing that. And there's, a, there's even an anecdote about the fact that he tends to rely on that. Let me think about this for a sec. It's in, I'll come back to it later because it's in this week. And then in that article, we've also got two other mini dialogues, I think, because we get these quite small like segments of dialogue in Xenophon. Um, so in that section, there's a discussion between Socrates and Antisthenes, one of his best friends, possibly the founder of cynicism. And they have this, again, a weird conversation about friendship, where, oddly, like they talk about friends as if they were slaves that you would buy or sell. And he, it's, which it seems like, many people have said, it seems like a very odd thing, you know, almost a slightly chilling conversation that they're having. But you'll see they're having this conversation for a reason. That someone, they're doing it on purpose because they know that someone is overhearing, listening in, and they want to influence this guy to think more carefully about his own behaviour as a friend. So they're talking, Socrates and Antisthenes, again, having this weird, half-serious conversation about, you know, Fred over there, like, you know, how much do you think you'd sell him for as a friend? Like, how much is he actually worth in monetary terms? And... And then they think other friends that are kind of priceless. You can't even imagine accepting, you know, any amount of money to to abandon uh, your friendship with them, you know. And there's a there's a bit of a backstory to that actually, because in Athens, there was a lot of litigation that went on, and people I think often were selling out their friends quite literally. And and then also they have the slave markets and stuff, so it's not such an alien concept to them. But what they're really trying to get at again is to flip this around and then encourage us to think how much we are worth to our friends. And putting a monetary value on it, I point out to you, is not really that different from rating yourself 0 to 10 or as a percentage as we would do in modern therapy. It's a rating system, pretty much the same. So the question is, you know, 
give yourself marks out of 10 for how good a friend you are in general or to this particular person say you rate yourself 6 out of 10 then you can say well you know what would you have to do to get it up to 7 out of 10 like and it just works as a cognitive tool to help people reevaluate and think of ways that they can improve their friendships although it might not be obvious at first that's essentially what they're doing in that dialogue um, also there's another mini dialogue in that section Socrates on friendship and the memorabilia and it's with this guy we don't funnily enough this is one person we don't know anything about Diodorus um, I don't think we really have any information about this guy but he gets in a conversation with Socrates about how he could get friends real cheap because there are people, it's tr there are troubled times going on, and again, it seems like an oddly mercenary conversation. But Socrates is actually making a very compassionate point. Oh, and it, I think there's a little bit about Fido in here, and the uh, you know the the fact that Socrates had these very wealthy friends, but he also had very poor friends. His wealthy friends were kind of happy to act as patrons, and so he often encouraged them to go and help other people who were in need to do things that were kind of philanthropic and he'd say look you know the, the present time there are so many people desperate for help in Athens that you know actually if he thinks of it in this peculiar way like so you're, you're getting good friends for a bargain price like you know they don't need much in order for you to you know a man of your means could easily be helping all of these people so he persuades people to act pretty philanthropically and then they'll often say that they had you know, friends for life as a result of doing that. It's part of his kind of matchmaker behaviour. It's, it's an odd perspective. Then we have a video uh, about this quarrel uh, also in Xenophon between two of Socrates' lifelong friends, um, two brothers called Heracrates, the younger brother, who we don't know that much about, uh, and then his older brother Chirophon is one of Socrates' uh, closest associates. Uh, he was the guy that went to the Oracle at Delphi and said, is there anyone wiser than Socrates? Uh, so he's being talked about in this dialogue by his younger brother. He says he can't stand him and finds him insufferable. And this discussion, like Socrates basically intervenes and he tries to reconcile these two warring brothers and again, I'll, I'll come back to this later there's a, there are several examples of Socrates having this talent for smoothing over arguments and reconciling people that have fallen out and how he thought it was important to do that um, there's another example uh, I'll come to later but again, it has this reference to what I would call cognitive distancing in it so, uh, yeah, at one point, Socrates is encouraging Chirocrates to think, like, does everyone have a problem getting on with your brother? And he says, well, no, like, that annoys me even more, because like, he seems to get on really well with everyone else. And what Socrates is doing really sneakily is encouraging him to realise, well, maybe it's not entirely him. You know, maybe if everyone else manages to get on with him, maybe it's something about the way that you're responding to him. You know, maybe you need to kind of think about your perspective like the way that you're dealing with him and you know again it's not things that upset us it's not Hierophon that upsets us but our thinking about him but interestingly Heracrates, the younger brother, puts up quite a lot of resistance to that line of argument and actually you know sometimes in the platonic dialogues we don't see that you know it, it, there's people often joke about the fact that um, the other participant in the dialogue often just kind of agrees, seems to agree. Glaucon in the Republic like, seems to do an awful lot of head nodding and ag agreeing with some quite strange things that Socrates is saying, not really properly arguing with him. But uh, Caracrates is not having it and he's disagreeing uh, a fair amount with Socrates. So he's Socrates got a kind of like reeling in a fish or something he's got to struggle with him a little bit to persuade this guy just to go and make up with his brother um, and then he talks about he says at the end well I wouldn't know how to do it anyway um, you know how am I going to uh, deal with this and Socrates basically says look you know this already you already have the resources you know and he uses this line of questioning uh, where he says look if you wanted someone to um show you hospitality when you were visiting their country how would you, how would you do that 
And Karakrachi says, well, like, everyone knows, like, the etiquette is that you show them hospitality first. Like, if they're visiting Athens, then, uh, you know, and the assumption that if it, the tables are turned and one day you're in their country, they'll return the favour. Uh, Socrates says, if you want to be invited by someone to a party they're throwing, what would you do? Karakrachi said, well, I'd probably make a point of inviting them to uh, a party first in the hope that they, that would encourage them to reciprocate. And Socrates says, well, you know, do you how would you apply this knowledge to your brother? Like, and it's basically leading him to this conclusion that maybe he should go and make the initial effort at reconciling things and encouraging him to kind of like view that as an appropriate uh, way of dealing with the situation. So there's that kind of introduction to what Socrates says about friendship. There's quite a lot packed in there. It's quite dense. And then there's another video uh, about a guy called Critobulus that Socrates, that she's actually the son of Crito, his other childhood friend, and how this young man wants to acquire more friends. I guess it's like he's at a stage in life. Uh, maybe he's like an adolescent or a young adult and he's he wants to kind of be introduced to wider society and interestingly he's talking to Socrates who's known for having loads of friends and introducing people to each other across all walks of life and this is all about the double standard again but it's interesting because it's applied to friendship so Socrates starts off by saying to the guy well what would be the best type of friend to have and he gets him in a really interesting bind as a result by showing him that he starts off thinking, well, these are the sort of friends I'm looking for. And then Socrates basically makes him realise that he's not really exhibiting those qualities himself and that he's looking in the wrong direction. Like he should be, rather than figuring out how he can meet people or be introduced to them, he should be thinking more about making himself deserving or worthy to have these kind of friends and and, and Socrates said I, and I can I can do the work of introducing you that's the easy part um, but you know I my only condition is that and all I have to do is praise you to other people and they'll want to be your friend but the only condition I have is that I will only praise you truthfully like so you have to be able to look me in the eye as it were and tell me the, you're the sort of person who deserves to be praised as a friend. It's a really interesting way that this dialogue goes. It starts off seeming pretty simple. What sort of qualities would you be looking for in a friend? And it ends up like really turning it around on the guy. And he's like, okay, I get what you're saying. I kind of need to work on myself a little bit first. And then, you know, like the other part of it, like being introduced to people, sort of follows naturally from that. And, or Socrates, anyway, saying he's going to solve that problem for him. It's, that's the least of his worries. Then we have um, Plato's dialogue about friendship, which interestingly, like Xenophon often gives us these more, this more dogmatic Socrates in a way. Um, the, you know, it's easier to see what Socrates is, is the positive teachings are, whereas in Plato, especially the earlier dialogues, they're often um, more Socratic midwifery. They're more there's more apparea. Uh, the more inconclusive and the Lysis is like that uh, it's a typical early dialogue it's like the Carmides um, and they discuss friendship in a fascinating way but it kind of circles around the concept and never really gets to the heart of it so if you can abide with that then they do raise some interesting points for example Socrates asks Lysis uh, and his friend uh, Menexenus who is a friend? The lover, the beloved, or both? Like, what, 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 what constitutes being a friend? Like, if we love someone but they don't reciprocate and love us in return, are they our friend? Like, so he asks these quite penetrating questions. And then he, he asks, does like attract like in friendships? Do opposites attract in friendships? That's problematic, because then bad men would be attracted to good men and vice versa. Um, and then he raises this theory which I would kind of gloss as follows. Uh, sometimes I think what Socrates is saying is much simpler than it, it kind of comes across as being in the translation. 
Like, so, you know, if we are willing to kind of like read between the lines a little bit, at this point, I think what he's essentially saying is, is friendship like a remedy? He compares it to a physician prescribing a medicine. So is it kind of satisfying a need that we have? He talks about it as, uh, as us befriending something good in order to get rid of something bad that's afflicting us. So do we understand friendship as a kind of therapy, a remedy, a fixing of a problem? Um, and he says, he says, this is a kind of viable way of looking at it, but there's problems with that as well. Because then how do we explain remaining friends with people once we've overcome the problem? And then the final definition that he touches on very briefly and, and kind of then abandons is this idea that maybe friendship is something more vaguely defined as what's congenial. So not necessarily people that resemble us or are the opposites of us or that remedy some problem, but maybe that they complement our personality, their personality complements ours in, in some other kind of way. So you can see it ends in upper area, it never really arrives at a definite conclusion. Um, but nevertheless, it sort of circles or spirals around this concept. And I think it sheds some light on it. it helps to understand some of the other discussions that he has. Um, this dialogue uh, is also notoriously uh, difficult in some ways. Uh, the context that it takes place in is also very relevant to understanding it. He's in a wrestling school, he's talking to a man who's infatuated with a, a young boy. Um, and so it necessarily raises these issues of Greek pederasty uh, or Athenian pederasty, which was a complex social construct as it were. Um, and it, it does take a little bit of effort to really understand what's going on in these relationships. In some ways it's pretty simple what's going on, but, but in other ways there's, they're so different from the way that we think about sexual relationships and friendships today. And sometimes the line is kind of blurry between them. And Socrates' position about this is kind of a little bit ambiguous as well. So we have to wrestle with what were the Greeks really thinking of when they talk about these relationships? And uh, incidentally, in that dialogue, Socrates touches on the subject of abuse, but he does it kind of fleetingly and ambiguously towards the end. You know, he, he says that he makes this fleeting comment, or Plato puts it in his mouth anyway, towards the end of the dialogue where he says, uh, some men are predators. Uh, he says argument, sometimes an argument like some men can be a predator, he says to this young boy in the wrestling school. Um, while his older uh, admirer is kind of observing from the shadows. So is Socrates kind of warning this boy off about this guy? Or there are some complicated things going on there, ambiguous things. Uh, then we have the video, uh, another video about Polymarchus and the son of Cephalus in the Republic. So I don't want to go way over time, but I kind of would like to say a little bit about that. I, this is one of the most interesting parts of the Platonic Dialogues. It's right into the guts of what is justice, and a very famous definition of justice. So Polymarchus, I should say, tragic figure, bit of context. Um, his father passed away, he inherited his wealth. Then the Peloponnesian War ended, the Spartans were victorious over the Athenians and installed a, a, like a junta uh, called the Thirty Tyrants over Athens and they were in control for eight months. Um, they carried out uh, summary executions of their enemies. Uh, they became very brutal. So I've got a section later on uh, explaining more about that part of the history because it's very important. Polymarchus, we know as a foreign resident, as an immigrant, uh, a wealthy immigrant, was arrested on trumped up charges. Uh, all his wealth was seized. He was executed by drinking hemlock. And an interesting detail, we're told that one of the 30 tyrants grabbed his wife uh, outside their house, I think, and ripped the gold earrings from her ears. I... I wouldn't labour this analogy, like, because it's not exactly the same, but you could see, you could make some comparison between the persecution 
of uh, Jews uh, in Nazi Germany and the tyrants kind of going after wealthy immigrants, like executing them and seizing their property. So it was a reign of terror, basically, not anything like on the same scale. Uh, but these guys were justly described as tyrants and they caused a lot of political turmoil in Athens. And so I'm mentioning that a little bit because, it's, again, it's the context here of a discussion about the nature of justice, the difference between right and wrong, what makes a good ruler and so on. And here at Polymarchus, uh, this guy everyone would know who was brutally uh, executed uh, unjustly uh, is the main character in this part of the dialogue. So he starts off, actually inherits the discussion from Cephalus, his father, and he mentions this traditional definition that justice is paying your debts, which again, reading between the lines, basically seems to mean giving people what they deserve is the, the kind of implication of it. Paying your debts, repaying people, or doing to people what, what they deserve from you, what they have a right to expect from you. That's what one way of understanding what justice is, fulfilling your obligations in a sense. Uh, but then that leads into another classic definition of justice, which is that justice consists in helping your friends and harming your enemies. And that harming your enemies part is sometimes known as the law of retaliation, lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And Socrates is going to dispute that, basically. It's one of the most interesting parts of the Republic. So Socrates is going to go straight after this idea that justice consists in helping your friends and harming your enemies. He's going to attempt to refute it as inconsistent. So it leads to the conclusion uh, that he never really explicitly states, I don't think, but he implies that justice consists both in helping friends and in helping enemies. And it's interesting the way that he arrives at that conclusion. And then I added a little bit to the end of that from the cry to another platonic dialogue where he, he talks about this in a much more cursory manner. He, he sums up his position, he states it more dogmatically. Um, and he says some things which I think are partly noteworthy because they are obviously very similar to things that are said in the Christian New Testament, uh, as you'll see, uh, but written 400 years earlier. So that's kind of curious. Uh, it's interesting to see that. Then we're going to just follow straight on from that part of the dialogue into another part, Republic Book 1, and there's an interesting change in the dynamic of the characters that Socrates is speaking to. First it's Cephalus, this kind of venerable, gentle old man, he's not really that interested in debate though, but just kind of shares his perspective with Socrates and says some very wise things. And then his son, who's a bit more up for a, a debate, he's drawing on nuggets of wisdom that he's maybe learned from sophists or other teachers. So it's getting a little bit abstract, a little bit more technical. And then this guy butts in, who's been waiting in the sidelines, called Thrasymachus, whose name actually means fierce fighter. And he's very much portrayed as an angry man. And it's interesting because his position is much more radical and he's now getting into more of at, at times quite a tense argument or like even at one point explicitly abusive you know he gets quite angry and starts shouting abuse a bit like sort of online arguments you know when people get angry about politics and they start calling each other idiots and stuff Thrasymachus who's this educator the sophist is very passionate very angry basically starts laying into Socrates uh, so the, the context is interesting. And his theory uh, is a little bit opaque at first. He's, it's like he's a little bit sneaky about admitting what it is. But cut a long story short, essentially, um, a number of sophists wanted to say that wisdom and courage are virtues, but they appear to have dismissed temperance and justice as being virtues or questioned them and where Socrates wants to defend these as, as virtues. And so what this guy's saying uh, is also interesting because he is adopting a kind of contrarian position. You'd think that these were the sort of teachings that you would get executed for 
on a charge of corrupting the youth. So Socrates may be being confused with these sort of guys who are more openly uh, teaching things that are contrary to tradi traditional uh, Athenian ethics. And he's also, Thrasymachus has been compared to Friedrich Nietzsche uh, because he says some things that resemble what Nietzsche says about slave morality versus master morality. And I would say, probably maybe without naming names, that Thrasymachus also reminds me of a number of modern day personal development, uh, self-improvement gurus who have these kind of radical uh, teachings, question uh, notions of uh, equality and justice and so on, uh, and maybe adopt a slightly more aggressive position. And so it's interesting to see how Socrates responds to this because we can see echoes of it in modern political and ethical debates. Um, so his first definition, Thrasymachus says that justice is, his basic definition is that justice is nothing but the interests of the stronger. And what he means by that is that what people call justice is just what those in power think is best for themselves because they're the ones that create the laws and stuff. And then I'm not going to follow through the argument here because I think it would probably take us too long, but you'll see there are a number of steps that he goes through here. And Socrates appears to, whether you agree with him or not, uh, Socrates attempts to, to show that he, he gets himself in a contradiction by proposing this view. And at the end of this section of the dialogue, Thrasymachus explodes like he's absolutely furious because he feels that he's kind of been tricked a bit by Socrates. He's not convinced at all. But he also starts to feel that he's, he's been made to look kind of stupid. He's been made to contradict himself in front of an audience of potential students, paying students. So he ends up saying that people who believe in justice are weak and they're the losers. They're like suckers. Like, so it's pretty cynical with a small c position that he's advocating. Then there's another article, uh, which I hope at some point to make into a video, on the second half of this dialogue with Thrasymachus, where he kind of starts again, now getting really angry, and this idea that justice is folly. Um, I won't, again, I won't go into it in detail. You'll see the f nature that the argument takes. Uh, but Socrates again appears to refute him uh, from a different perspective and Socrates then argues more positively in favour of the position that the just are ultimately happier and stronger in the long run than the unjust are and part of, I'll, I'll let you know part of his reasoning for that is he wants to argue that justice makes friends and allies and a just state or a just ruler is ultimately going to surround himself uh, with people that are healthier, happier, more in harmony and that's going to make him stronger in the long run. In the short term a tyrant might be more powerful but it, it, essentially, uh, in a word, it's always going to end in tears like he's essentially what he's saying. Um, so the real strength ultimately consists in the ability to bring people together in harmony. That's the position that he's advocating for. And then famously, you, know, you may say this is you know, how Plato chose to put it, but the dialogue ends up with Thrasymachus blushing and shutting up because he, Socrates appears to have tied him in knots. But you may read it and think Socrates is a sophist and that Thrasymachus is right. So, you know, nevertheless, it get, cuts right to the heart of, like, I think one of the most important kind of debates that I see played out over and over again on the internet. So, you know, I think more people should be aware of this so that they can go, this is the same discussion that Socrates had two and a half thousand years ago. Like, and these guys are, like, now sounding like Thrasymachus and not realising, you know, and are they thinking about some of the objections that Socrates might have raised? You know, like, you... It, there's nothing new under the sun. Like you'll see, like you'll see the same kind of dynamic going on today. Um, then there's an excerpt to discuss about Socrates' friends and how they reacted to his sentence. Uh, so I'll let you have a look at that and comment on it. I'm not going to say much more about it just now. 
And then the exercise that we're going to do this week builds on the previous two weeks. And essentially, well, hopefully it works kind of both ways. It'll be easier to do this now, having done those, but it also shed more light in the preceding exercises. Because all I'm really going to ask you to do is do the values clarification and activity scheduling, but focusing it, if you haven't already, specifically on your relationships. And so think of being a good friend as a virtue or what virtues uh, would constitute a good friend, rate yourself, like giving yourself a monetary value or marks out a 10. And then think about small activities that you could engage in, like uh, Caracrates, uh, thinking, well, you know, what sort of things would you do if you want your brother to reciprocate? Like think about brainstorming things that you could do in order to improve, to act more like a friend and improve the quality of your friendships, even if it's just sending an email or making a phone call, schedule them and do them. Like, so we're going to look at a slightly more specific area. I think that will make things more concrete. And it obviously ties into all the stuff that you're going to be looking at uh, this week in the course. The bonus sections, I'll just touch on briefly. Cause I can see we've been going for about an hour now. Um, Socrates and Parenting from Xenophon. There's a fascinating dialogue. Again, like the one with Heracrates and uh, Chirophon. Uh, resolving an argument, but this time between Socrates' own son, Lamprocles, and his mother, Xanthope. And so kind of similar in a sense, but he actually employs slightly different arguments, with some similarities and some differences. It, so again, shows us something about friendship, but also what Socrates thought about parenting and the relationships between children and parents. So I find that a, a fascinating dialogue as a therapist as well. It's like relationships counselling or something going on. And there are techniques in it that I recognise weirdly as being familiar. Like, you know, Socrates is acting like a relationships counsellor. The stuff he's doing, unsurprisingly, in a way, you know, although it's still a shock to see it two and a half thousand years ago, resembles stuff, you know, in a way resembles stuff that you might do in modern day cognitive therapy or relationships counselling. And then we've got this historical uh, article. We looked at Socrates' career as a soldier. Now we're going to look at one of the most famous people in his life, uh, Critias, um, who was one of his students, or at least an associate, who then later uh, became one of the 30 tyrants and uh, kind of kept threatening to execute Socrates. Um, so he was one of the people that were responsible for the execution of Polymarchus. And, you know, this ambiguity that he, people saw him as an associate of Socrates. So Socrates is kind of tainted by association with this guy. But also, you know, sometimes people, there's this debate about the extent to which Socrates had pro-Spartan sympathies. And I'd like to actually write more about that, and kind of produce more of a balanced perspective. But... I, I feel in some ways that case is overstated and this article about 30 tyrants I think you know just goes through some of the things that we hear about Socrates it's often said that Socrates remained in Athens when a lot of the Democrats had gone into exile so I.F. Stone for example really labours that point in his best-selling book The Trial of Socrates which deliberately adopts a very partisan position they are kind of blaming Socrates and stuff um, controversial I should say and I, I guess it was I.F. Stone in a way that inspired me to say let's just set out the stuff we're told about what Socrates actually did like did under the the oligarchy uh, for this eight months under the thirty tyrants because when we read it through, I think it really doesn't come across like he was uh, at all supporting this regime. You know, quite the contrary. And we don't know how much this stuff is true. Of course, you know, it might be propaganda that Xenophon and Plato are giving us. But the picture that we're given uh, is of a man who really was an agitator in a way and kind of insubordinate and defied the laws of the, the oligarchs, uh, disputed them, they saw him as a problem, they at least once, perhaps twice, seemed to have threatened to execute him. Um, so I think when you read that bit of the history, it paints 
uh, a picture of Socrates, I guess as a political agitator in a way, not directly involved in politics, but kind of commenting on it in the sidelines and then causing a political storm in a way, just as in his later trial by just, you know, like in a way just by being Socrates and yeah, like questioning things and, and not complying with stuff and basically making a nuisance of, nuisance of himself. But in his trial, he was doing that during a democracy. It, it's kind of reassuring in a way to see him doing it in the face of the the tyranny, the oligarchy, like these guys who more obviously deserved, like Socrates to be thumbing his nose at them and making a kind of spectacle. So I think if you're que- interested in the politics, it's interesting to to read that side of things. Okay, so a lot this week because it's one of my favourite parts, and this is more content I think as well. And like I say, hopefully I'll get around to uploading another video. So there should be four videos. And as time goes on, you'll find there more and more content is added and more videos are added and a surprise that may be coming as well. So I hope that you found that useful and I hope that you've kind of been inspired to get into this stuff. Again, I don't want you to think that you have to agree with Socrates at all. You know, I I think like philosophers throughout the centuries, lovers of wisdom, you know, even during his lifetime and the centuries afterwards, right down to the present day, some of the people that got the most benefit from reading about Socrates are people that disagreed with him. And there actually is nothing wrong with thinking maybe the sophists had a point, you know, maybe they were right. Maybe, or maybe also in terms of his life, perhaps Socrates was in the wrong politically at times. So, you know, by no means, although I'm probably leaning towards painting a sympathetic picture of Socrates, like, but nevertheless, I'll encourage you to question that and to think about other ways that you could interpret both the philosophy and the events in his life, uh, interpret his character from different perspectives as well. But I, I hope that you find this week interesting because sometimes people think justice it seems like an abstract concept. Again, for the Greeks, it was a more down to earth concept and tying it in with friendship, I think, helps to make it seem a little bit more down to earth, a little bit more of immediate relevance, especially if you follow the exercise for the week and actually start thinking about evaluating your relationships, how just are you and the way that you deal with others, how much of a good friend are you, like try and take all the stuff, you know, think about it from the kind of Plato's abstract perspective in the Republic, like Polymarchus, like debating the nature of justice, but also then like Xenophon and the memorabilia, like thinking about practical changes you could actually make in your life. So hope you enjoy that and hope you enjoy week three and look forward to seeing you uh, same time, same place next week. It's Father's Day today, so you probably see I've got some cards in the background. Uh, So I'm off to kind of chill out and enjoy the sunshine outside. Goodbye from me once again in Nova Scotia and I'll see you all next week.